Hello guys, my name is Charles and in this video, we'll talk about earth life and science. So let's start with this question. What is earth? Earth is the planet that we live on. The reason that we can live on earth is because the planet isn't too hot nor too cold. Perfect for organisms to thrive and survive. More specifically, the planet that we live on is in the habitable zone of our solar system. With a biosphere that made of biomes or biophysical zones filled with complex e ecosystem from microbes, plants, animals, and us humans. With the right atmosphere that separates itself from the cold void space, a, ge a geosphere that is Earth itself, the rocks, surface, and the interior of the planet. A hydrosphere that, from, that forms oceans, taking up 71% of the Earth itself, and has a huge effect on why the Earth is a live, livable planet. A geomagnetic field that keeps out radiation coming from the sun. If not for those things, the Earth may not, may not have just been countless same planets that is inhabitable and unsuitable for life to grow. The four key terms that make up our planet habitable are biosphere, bio means life, Geosphere, geo means land or earth. Hydrosphere, hydro means water. Atmosphere, atmo means air or sky. Since the earth is a terrestrial planet or also known as a rocket planet, let us first start in the discussion of rocks and minerals that are present on earth and it will be discussed by er Edward. Thank you, Charles. Now let's talk about rocks. Our earth is mostly consists of rocks. Rocks are composed of mineral grains combined in different ways, having various properties. Rocks are composed of one or more minerals or mineraloids, but do not have crystal structure. Our Earth consists of three major types of rock. First is igneous rocks are characterized as rock types that are produced as a result of solidification of a molten rock. The next is sedimentary rocks, are rocks that are formed on or around the surface of the planet. And lastly, metamorphic rocks. These are rocks that are, were once igneous and sedimentary but have changed because of the intense heat within the Earth's crust. Minerals are naturally occurring chemical compounds in which atoms are arranged in three-dimensional patterns. The majority of the rocks are formed by combination of a few common minerals called rock-forming minerals. The examples of these are feldspar, quartz, amphiboles, micas, olivine, grenade, calcite, pyroxenes. Rock-forming minerals are identified by their physical and chemical properties. Rocks are made up of several different minerals. Minerals can be identified in different ways, by its color, hardness, luster, crystal forms, density, and cleavage. And that's all for rocks and minerals. Thank you. Since we've talked about rocks and minerals, we will now move forward and discuss the three major types of rocks. And we'll answer the question, how are the three major rocks, sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic rocks formed? And how is it related to exogenic and endogenic processes? We'll find it out through the discussions of our friend, Nico. Thank you. So the first one is, what is an exogenic process? The exogenic process has helped shape the landscape of our planet. Exogenic processes include geological phenomena and processes originate externally to the Earth's surface. It is related with the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere, and also the process of weathering, erosion, and deposition. The exogenic process is important because it forms and creates a variety of landscapes. Such examples are fertile woodlands, levees, and deltas from their running rivers. Now we'll discuss weathering, erosion, and deposition. 
Weathering is the process where heat surface and some surface rock disintegrate, salt or are broken down. Rocks that are on the earth's surface are exposed to different chemicals and compositions. There are two types of weathering, physical and chemical weathering. Physical weathering is when rock is broken but no chemical changes take place. Factors that take place when physical weathering is present are temperature change changes, freezing, and salt crystal growth. Chemical weathering takes place when the air or water interacts with crystal in a rock to change their chemical composition. Factors that take place during chemical weathering is can take the form of oxidation by the air or dissolving by water and other chemicals in the water, such as sulfuric acid and acid rain. We will move on to erosion. Erosion takes place when natural forces move, whether rock and soil from one place to another. It can be transported by land or through the sea. Water is a common way that pieces of earth are moved to a new location. Wind also contributes to erosion by blowing the particles away. And lastly, we'll talk about deposition. Deposition occurs when pieces of earth are deposited somewhere else. It is a constructive process that moves down or places weathered or and eroded materials in a location that is different from their source. And the position also changes the shape of the land. So what is an endogenic process? The endogenic process have a lot to contribute how our planet Earth moves today by creating new islands from the volcanoes beneath the ocean head. Endogenic processes include magmatism, volcanism, and metamorphism for everything that occurs beneath the Earth's surface, this energy comes from inferior parts of the Earth, from the core to the mantle. First, we'll tackle magnetism, more commonly, this involves magma. Magma is not a rock due to extreme temperature that lies beneath the Earth's surface. Magmatism plays a key role in magma formation, as near as some big magmas produce additional mass and volume to the Earth's surface in the subsurface. The next thing is volcanism. So what comes in mind when we hear volcanism? It brings the term volcanoes. Volcanism occurs because it's a part of a cycle. The process of volcanism acts like a cooler exhaust system of our planet. It is associated with the tectonic plates and a part of rock cycle. Volcanism occurs when magma gets to the surface. The metal dust comes in different forms. Lava, ash, crust and rock fragments. And lastly, metamorphism. Metamorphism is a change that takes place within a body of rock as a result of it being subjected to conditions that are different from those in which it forms. Metamorphism happens when rocks are subjected to deep periodic tectonic forces such as folding, and high pressures and temperatures, the textures and mineral compositions begin to change. This process leads to the formation of metamorphic rocks. These rocks are from through pre-existing rocks. Let us we talk about exogenic and endogenic process. We now head on to these three types of rocks that are discussed earlier. But how are they formed? Let's first start with sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are formed from pre-existing rocks or pieces of once living organisms that accumulate on Earth's surface. Also, these rocks are classified into three groups, plastic, biologic, and chemical. Plastic sedimentary rocks are made up of pieces, glass, or pre existing rocks loosened by weathering. Biologic sedimentary rocks from form when living organisms die, pile up, and are then compressed and cemented together. Chemical sedimentary rocks form by chemical precipitation that begins when water traveling through a rock dissolves some of the minerals. These minerals are carried away from their source and eventually redeposited or precipitated when the water evaporates from it. The second rock that we'll discuss is igneous rock. So how is igneous rock formed? Igneous rock is formed when molten rock passes to the surface. It undergoes changes in temperature and pressure that cause it to cool, solidify, and crystallize. Either at volcanoes on the surface of the earth, or while the melted rock is still inside the earth, crust, all magma develops underground. In the lower crust or upper mantle because of the intense heat there. An example of where you can find these types of rocks are active volcanoes who had a recent eruption. 
as time passes, the lava flow creates these rocks along its curve. And lastly, we will discuss metamorphic rocks. How are metamorphic rocks formed? Metamorphism, which will literally translate to change in form, is the process through which metamorphic rocks are created from pre existing rock. Heat and pressure are applied to that protolith or original rock, changing its physical, chemical, and mineralogical properties. Seismic activity in the Earth's crust causes sedimentary and igneous rocks to undergo extreme heat and pressure, which changes them and results in the formation of metamorphic rocks. Process of metamorphism. The process of metamorphism changes the rocks into denser, more compact rocks rather than melting them. Either by rearranging of mineral constituents or through chemical reaction with fluids that enter the rocks, new minerals are produced. Even when rocks that have already undergone metamorphosis may undergo changes due to the pressure or temperature. Rocks subject to metamorphism are frequently crumpled, smeared, and compressed. Metamorphic rocks do not grow hot enough to melt, because if they did, they would turn into igneous rocks. Examples of common metamorphic rocks Marble is formed from sedimentary rock limestone. Quartzite is formed from the sedimentary rock sandstone. Slate is formed from the sedimentary rock limestone. Fernulite is formed from the igneous rock basalt. Schist is formed from the sedimentary rock mudstone. There are two kinds of metamorphic rocks polluted metamorphic rocks and non polluted metamorphic rocks. Some kinds of metamorphic rocks, granite gneiss and biotite schist, are, for example, are strongly branded or polluted. Polluted means the parallel arrangement of certain mineral things that gives the rock a strike appearance, polyhedron forms from pressure species that cut or elongate materials within a rock so they become aligned. These rocks develop a plaity or shape-like structure that reflects the duration the pressure was applied. Unfoliated metamorphic rocks. Unfoliated metamorphic rocks do not have a plaity or shape-like structure. There are several ways that unfoliated rocks can be produced. Some rocks, such as limestone, are made of minerals that are not flat or elongated. No matter how much pressure of light, the grains will not align. Another type of metamorphism, contact metamorphism, which occurs when hot igneous rocks intrude into some pre existing rock. The pre existing rock is essentially baked by the heat, changing the mineral structure of the rock without addition of pressure. The characteristics of metamorphic rocks are they are created when sedimentary or igneous rocks are altered. The original rock's constituent parts will react and become under the influence of heat and of pressure. Their texture is frequently squashed, polluted, or banded, and they are crystalline. Rocks that have undergone metamorphism typically exhibit high levels of resistance to weathering and erosion, making them exceptionally durable and a popular choice for building materials. That is all for the three types of rocks in its process. Now that we talk about the three types of rocks and its processes, we'll now talk about the tectonic plates, how the rock responds, how odd supercontinents exist, and if the plates cause earthquakes and volcanoes themselves. This topic of discussion will be explained by Ken. Thank you. Let's now talk about plates. Tectonic plates are Earth's outermost layer or deeper sphere made up of the crust and upper mantle, which were broken into large rocky plates. These plates lie on top of a partial molten layer of rocks called the asthenosphere. These plates are moving slowly, and when plates move with each other, it causes short-term and long-term results. In short-term results of plates' movement, stress is applied to the plates, which causes rocks to be formed and causes earthquakes and volcanoes to erupt. In the fault lines were active. When the stress is applied, it causes a material change in shape, deformation, or strain. In geological terms, it is the force applied to rock per unit area. It usually responds depending on the type of rocks, surrounding, temperature, and pressure condition. Since we mentioned deformation, deformation a type of response that happens in the rock. When stress appears, it causes a different types of deformation. Elastic deformation, rock returns to original shape. Plastic deformation, rock does not return to its original shape. And fracture, 
stock begins to have tax and trades. Now we know about the formation. Let's now discuss stress, which causes the formation. Stress is a force applied to rocks that causes the formation. There are different stress that occurs in the earth's crust, which are three known types of stress that occurs on rocks. First one is compressional stress. This type of stress causes the rocks to push against one another. Compression squeezes rocks together, causing rocks to fold or fracture. Compression is the most common stress at convergent plate boundaries. Tensional stress. This stress causes the rocks to be pulled apart and causes the rocks to go to different directions. Tension can happen simply with two separate plates can move further away from each other or the ends of one plate can move in different direction. Example is mid-Atlantic ridge, which is formed by two tectonic plates pulling apart from each other. Here's stress. Rocks are going in different direction and slides to, to left to right. When shear stress occurs, the force of the stress pushes some of the crust in different directions. When this happens, a large part of the crust can break off, which makes the place size smaller. Shear stress usually happens when two plates stack against each other. As they move in opposite direction, the friction of a shear stress at the edges of the place can cause earthquakes. The Earth's surface it, the Earth's surface is composed of about 15 to 20 tectonic plates. And in the place map, there are seven major and eight minor types of plates. Which from major plates are Eurasian plate, North American plate, South American plate, African plate, Pacific plate, Indo-Australian plate, Antarctic plate, while in minor, in minor plates are Nazca plate, Scotia plate, Philippines plate, Caribbean plate, Arabian plate, Indian plate, Juan de Ruka plate, and Caucasus plate. One common area where the Earth's most active tectonic plates are located called Pacific Ring of Fire. 75 of Earth's volcanoes, more than 450 volcanoes, are located along the Ring of Fire. 90% of the Earth's earthquakes occurs along its path, including the latest magnitude 7.5 earthquake that happens in northern Luzon, which is the planet's most violent and dramatic seismic event. One common fact is that our country, Philippines, is located in the Pacific Ring of Fire, and earthquakes occur at least 20 times a day throughout the country, and about 300 volcanoes started among the island, 20 of which are active. Since we're talking about short-term results, earthquakes and, or any tectonic plates event may not happen without place movement from place boundaries. We will now talk about place boundaries. Plate boundary is a fracture or boundary that separates two tectonic plates. Tectonic plates are segments of the Earth's crust, less dense, Thicker continental crust and dense, thin oceanic crust, and the upper mantle. The plates move by convection currents within the mantle. Plates separate a constructive margin, forming a new crust and causing volcanic eruptions. Plates collide at destructive margins, which causes abduction, earthquakes, volcanic mountains, and fault mountains. There are three main types of plates boundaries. These are convergent plates boundaries, divergent plate boundary, and transform plate boundary. The fun is convergent plate boundary. It is a plate boundary where two tectonic plates move toward each other or collided head on. Convergent plate boundaries are usually destructive. As these two plates push against each other, the denser one sinks into the mantle beneath the other, this process is called subtraction. 
This type of movement results in the formation of the mountain ranges, volcanoes, and earthquakes. There are three types of convergent place boundaries. The first one is oceanic crust and continental crust. It is the convergence between place carrying oceanic crust with plates carrying continental crust. An example of this is the Andes Mountain in South America. Next one is oceanic crust. Oceanic crust it is the convergence between two plates carrying oceanic crust. The two oceanic crust plates push against one another, causing older, denser, older plates sink into the mantle, of creating a new crust. An example of this is the Mariana Trench under the Philippine Plate. The last one, continental crust, two continental crust. It is the convergence between two plates carrying continental crust when two continental plates collided and pushed up. Creating mountain ridges, an example of this is the Himalayas in Asia. Divergent plate boundaries. It is a plate boundaries where two tectonic plates move apart from each other. Divergent plate boundaries are usually constructive. There are two ways of place boundaries diverge. Oceanic crust to oceanic crust. When oceanic plates move apart, they cut. They cause cracks in the sea floor. So this is called sea floor spreading. Magma rises from the metal and oozes out from the cracks, like a long thing under this volcano. This magma pulls to form a new crust of igneous rocks. Over time, the cooling magma piles up to form rice ridge called a mid-ocean ridge. An example of this is the East Pacific rice. Continental crust, continental crust. The movement results in the formation of ribs. A rib is a like drop zone at the point where the plates are moving apart. As the plates move apart, the crust widens in things. Valleys and volcanoes begin to form in and around the area. An example of this is the East African Rift. Lastly, transform plate boundary. It is a plate boundary where two tectonic plates slide horizontally. Plus one another, transform plate boundaries are usually conservative. As two plates slide past one another, place is neither added to the boundary nor destroyed. In a transformation boundary, there are no land points formed during this activity. An example of this is the San Andreas Fault and Pacific Ring, Pacific Rise in the South Pacific. The effects this for is from rocks. That's all for short term. We will now talk about the long term results of this movement. Long term result is the movement of the entire continent over millions of years, more, more commonly known as continental drift. In continental drift theory, Alfred Wagner proposed that the continents were once united into a single supercontinent called Pangaea, meaning all Earths in ancient Greece. He hypothesized that continents were moving arithmetically in a way slowly 250 million years ago. There is five pieces of evidence that shows that supercontinental Continents exist millions of years ago. The first one is Big Sophie. The continents look like they could fit together, much like puzzle places that have drifted apart. The similarities in the outline of the coastline of eastern South America and West Africa have been noted for some time. The second one is fossil evidence. Fossils of similar types of plants and animals in rocks of a similar age have been found on the shore of different continents. One proposed that the organisms had lived side by side, but that the lands had moved apart after they were dead and fossilized. He suggested that the organisms would not 
of being able to travel across the ocean. For example, fossils of mesosaurus of freshwater reptile have been found both in Brazil and Western Africa. Also, fossils of the land reptile like Lystrosaurus have been found in rocks of the same age in Africa, India, and Antarctica. The third one is the evidence from rocks. When the, when the geology of Eastern South America and Western Africa was mapped, it revealed that ancient rock outcrops reference over 2,000 2, million years old were continuous from one continent to the other. These mountains were probably once a part of a mountain range that broke when the continents separate as well as the similarities between the Appalachian. And the eastern and mountain ranges are evidence for the continental grip hypothesis. The fourth evidence is from climate change. Cold forms in warm and swampy forested wetland climates, yet large coal deposits have been found in Antarctica. Limestone deposits from coral reefs that form in tropical climates have been discovered in the northern United States, which is far from the equator. The fifth evidence is from the Earth's magnetic polarity. Magnetic crystal in fresh volcanic rocks point to the current magnetic north pole. No matter what continent or where on the continents the rocks are located, its current north magnetic pole is in northern Canada. All the rocks that are the same age and are located on the same, same continents point to the same location, but that, that location is not the current northern magnetic pole. Older rocks that are different ages do not point to the same location or to the current magnetic north pole. In other words, although, although the magnetic crystal were pointing to the magnetic pole, all the north pole, the location of the pole seems to wander. Scientists were amazed to find that the north magnetic pole changes location to time. Evidence shows that the location of the North Magnetic North Pole 80 million years before present. From then, 60, 40, 20, and now. There are three possible explanations for this. The continents remain fixed and the North Magnetic Pole move. The North Magnetic Pole stood still and the continents move. Both the continents and the North Pole move. That's all for the earthquakes and plate movement. Hope you guys uh, have something to learn in this topic. Now that we know about the rocks and plates, we will now discuss the last part of this video, which is the geological time scale. In this segment, we will process the Earth's history and how it was interpreted in a geological time scale. It will be discussed by our friend. Eliza. Thank you, Charles. How can the Earth's history be interpreted from the geologic time scale? Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. However, the earliest evidence of life on Earth did not appear until 700 million years ago. Scientists created the geologic time scale to visualize the order and time frame of significant events on Earth over the last 4 billion years. The first principle you need to understand about the geologic time is that the laws of nature are always the same. This means that the laws describing how things work are the same today as they were billions of years ago. The Earth's surface has changed dramatically over the past 4.6 billion years. As these changes have occurred, organisms have evolved and remnants of some have been preserved as fossils. Scientists use fossils to learn about the age and history of Earth. Fossils are the preserved remains or traces of remains of ancient organisms on rocks. How are guide fossils used to define and identify subdivisions of the geologic time scale? 
Guide fossils are fossils that are abundant and widespread organisms at that time. Scientists use these guide fossils to learn about the age and history of Earth. Fossils are preserved remains or traces of remains of ancient organisms on rocks. They have two major ways of learning about the ages of fossils. Major ways of learning about the ages of fossils. Number one, relative dating. Relative dating is a method of arranging geological events based on the rock sequence. This method does not tell us the exact age of any rocks or fossil, but only whether it is young or older than other rocks and fossils. Absolute dating. Absolute dating is a method used to determine the actual age of rocks. Unlike relative dating methods, absolute dating methods provide chronological estimates of the age of certain geological materials associated with fossils and even direct measurements of the fossil material itself. Scientists do not determine the exact age of a fossil but do learn which ones are older or younger than others. Ordering rock layers from oldest to youngest was a first step in creating geological scale. It showed the order in which life on Earth changed. It also showed us how certain areas changed over time in regard to climate or type of environment. This is where stratified rocks come into play. But in order to know the age of stratified rocks, we must first know the meaning of stratified rocks. Stratified rocks are called stratified rocks because they consist of different layers in its structures. They are formed by accumulating and hardening of sediments such as mud, sand, silt, and disintegrated rocks over a long period of time. The age of stratified rocks can be measured using the absolute dating methods, sometimes called numerical dating, to give rocks date range in orders of years. Most absolute dates for rocks are obtained with radiometric methods. Radiometric dating it is a method where they determine the age of rocks by measuring the radioactive decay. Geologic principles that need to be remembered when identifying the age of stratified rocks. Principle of superposition. Younger rocks form on top of older ones. Therefore, we can generally assume that deeper strata are older than the strata that lie above them. Principle of original horizontality. In some cases, geologic forces such as uplifts have tilted or folded the strata after they form, so that they are no longer horizontal. In these cases, geologists must carefully study the strata to figure out which layers were laid down first. Principle of Fossil Succession Strata that contains fossils of the same types must be approximately the same age. Based on the fact that different organisms lived and went extinct at different times in the past, creating an order of succession, which fossils came earlier and later, that we can identify in the fossil record. Principle of Inclusion When one rock is enclosed within another, the enclosed rock, the inclusion, must be older than the rock that surrounds it. Principle of cross-cutting relationships. Anything that cuts through a rock such as a crack or a dike made up of other rock must be younger than the rock that it cuts through. Principle of unconformity. A clear break between rock layers called an unconformity marks a place where part of the rock record is missing so that the rocks just below the unconformity formed billions of years before the rocks just above it. Scientists divided Earth's history into several chunks of time when the fossils showed similar things living on the Earth. They gave each chunk of time a name to help them keep track of how Earth has changed. Scientists divide the Mesozoic era into three periods, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Triassic period, 252 to 201 million years ago. All continents during the Triassic period were part of a single landmass called Pangaea. Pangaea was a supercontinent that existed during the late Paleozoic and early Mesozoic eras. It was assembled from the earlier 
continental units of Gondwana, Euramerica, and Siberia during the Carboniferous approximately 335 million years ago. The climate was relatively hot and dry, and much of the land was covered with large deserts. The climate was relatively hot and dry, and much of the land was covered with large deserts. Unlike today, there were no polar ice caps. Jurassic period, 201 to 145 million years ago. At the end of the Triassic period, there was a mass extinction that causes of which are still hotly debated. Many large land animals were wiped out but the dinosaurs survived, giving them the opportunity to evolve into a wide variety of forms and increase in number. The single land mass Pangaea slipped into two, creating Laurasia in the north and Gondwana land in the south. Temperatures fell slightly, although it was still warmer than today due to higher amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Rainfall increased as a result of the large seas appearing between the land masses. Cretaceous period, 145 to 66 million years ago. During Cretaceous, the land separated further into some of the continents we recognize today. Although, in different positions, this meant that dinosaurs evolved independently in different parts of the world, becoming more diverse. Other groups of organisms also diversified. The first snakes evolved during this time as well as the first flowering plants. Insect groups appeared including bees which helped increase the spread of flowering plants. And mammals now included tree climbers, ground dwellers, and even predators of small dinosaurs. Dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous period, after living on Earth for about 165 million years. Later, scientists used absolute dating to determine the actual number of years ago that events happened. That's all for geological scale. Now that we all know about Earth life and science, it really is amazing how our planet Earth is very old. And the study of Earth requires us to think about times that were millions or even billions of years ago. It is great that we can see a part of Earth's history from chunks of rocks and hardened fossils, to chunks of Earth plates and the process of how we got here to this day. Hopefully, there is something that you guys learned on this video. Thank you. I'm Charles from the team Little Einstein. Thank you and see you guys in our next video.